as I said, I, uh, I really got interested in this subject many years ago. I had uh, a teacher, a German teacher named Jennifer Taylor, and I'll talk a little bit more about her at the end, but she taught a film class called Horror Films in Weimar, Germany. And that class was hugely influential, and it talked about a lot of the movies that we're going to be showing today. Now, don't worry, I didn't just rip off her class. I've done a lot of my own research as well. But I think that looking at the making of Nosferatu and this period of time in history, the really interesting question is, if you paid close enough attention to these movies, could you have seen what was about to happen? Uh, and so let's talk about that. Let's just get started. So the first thing to understand is that all of these movies are made in the immediate post-World War I era. Um, so uh, according to official estimates, about oh, 2 goodness. million German soldiers died in the war. Uh, so out of the 13.4 million that were called up, that means about one in six German soldiers died in World War I. Uh, that's about equivalent proportionally to the US Civil War, by the way. Um, half of them were 25 years old or younger. Uh, about a third of them were married and over 600,000 widows and over a million children were left fatherless. Um, and on top of all of that destruction, you also have uh, another major symptoms of decline is that the value of the Deutschmark, or at that time as it was called the Reichsmark, went from being about four Reichsmarks to the dollar, to the US dollar at the beginning of the war, to 130 billion uh, Reichsmarks to the dollar by the end of the war. Um, so the whole economy collapsed along with this massive death. It's also believed that about um, as many people died from food insecurity inside of Germany as from the war. And then on top of all of that, very relevant to now, you also have the influenza pandemic, uh, known colloquially as the Spanish flu, um, which killed hundreds of thousands of Germans. And, and Europe as a whole, from March 1918 to June 1920, um, killed twice as many Europeans as did World War I. Uh, when I was in college, I had a European history professor that remarked that if you took the deaths from starvation, the deaths from the war, and then the deaths from the influenza pandemic and put them all together, the World War I period was the worst catastrophe to strike Europe since the Black Death of the Middle Ages. So this is all happening. The Weimar Republic begins in this period immediately after this destruction. And it begins in a very interesting way. I think most, um, uh, certainly Americans, I'm sure New Zealand's are probably the same way, believe that this was a purely military victory, that the Allied powers defeated the Germans on the battlefield and that's how the war ended. But that really only tells half the story. Indeed, the Russian Revolution had taken the whole Eastern Front out of the equation and the Germans had had the ability to have a much stronger presence on the Western Front. But as that was happening, of course, the US shows up, involved, brings in this huge supply of men and material and money into the Western Front. And the war is fought to this horrible standstill. And then the Spanish flu breaks out and, and the food insecurity, it, the whole country is just falling apart. And so in uh, the October 1918 period, there's a desire to have a new government that can negotiate a peace deal with the allies. Wilson. Woodrow Wilson has released his 14 points. The Germans think that that's the deal they're going to get. And if the 14 points had been what they got, it probably would have been a much nicer conclusion, as we know it wasn't. But they're trying to pull back forces. So they're ordering people to stand down. Well, the Admiralty decides that that's crap, and they're going to send the battleships out and the U-boats out and start a whole nother campaign on the open seas. When they decide to do that, there's a massive mutiny of the sailors themselves. About half the sailors just refuse to go along with it. And in the city of Kiel, they start this huge mutiny on November the 3rd, where they actually like take control of the city of Kiel. That spreads all over Germany. Um, so you have the German Navy running around and basically declaring uh, a revolution. And this is all in November 1918. So you then have a, a series of internal revolutions in which the Kaiser is forced to abdicate on November the 8th. In fact, he is told that he has abdicated over the radio on November the 8th. Um, De Bavaria on that same day declares independence and forms a socialist state. Um, and then finally, after this, all of this crazy stuff going on inside of Germany, the German army is able to negotiate an armistice on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, November 11th, 1918. Um, so they negotiate this armistice, but the end of that war doesn't really bring peace and stability. As I said, their currency is basically worthless at this point. And so 
uh, you then have this huge revolution that comes about in late December 1918, a group called the Spartacus Corps, which is made up of, of well armed uh, communist revolutionaries, starts forming right around Christmas time. And then in January, they make a strike in 1919 and actually attack and overthrow the independent Weimar Republic. Um, when they do this, uh, they declare essentially a socialist revolution in Germany, uh, but that only lasts for a couple of days because a group of, of retired veterans uh, form a group called the Fry Corps or the Free Corps, who then overthrow the Spartacan uh, revolution, kill the leaders, and and bring the uh, and bring the Weimar Republic back into power. So all within the course of just a couple months, you know. Uh, the Kaiser is overthrown, a republic is established, the republic is overthrown by a communist group, uh, and then the communists are overthrown by the Fry Corps, and then the republic comes back. And then Bavaria is still an independent socialist state, all in the middle of this. So uh, 1919 Germany, Germany is just a mess. mess. Um, and it's very interesting because the philosopher I want to talk about, since this is for the philosophy club, is actually a guy named Siegfried Krakauer. Siegfried Krakauer lives through this period. Uh, he's hugely involved in all of this stuff. Um, what's perhaps most interesting is that uh, he's from a Jewish family. He's born in 1889. He did not serve in the military. He's not part of that uh, generation, um, but he became close friends uh, with a group of Marxists in Frankfurt called the Frankfurt School. He became a Marxist, although very interestingly for the time, he actually hated the Soviet Union. Uh, he was a committed Marxist, but he hated the Soviet Union. He hated Stalin. He hated um, everything that they were doing. And so he lamented the inability of the German communists to create a successful communist state and found that the revolutionaries just weren't very good. And, and so he had this real depth of sadness that the German revolution didn't go further and wasn't able to establish socialism. Um, now, throughout this whole period, what he actually does for work is that he's a film critic for the Frankfurter Zeitung, the biggest newspaper in Frankfurt, probably the biggest newspaper in Germany at the time. And while he's developing these Marxist ideas and witnessing all these revolutions, uh, he's also just reviewing the films. And so many years later in the 1940s, after World War II is over and he's escaped to the United States to survive the Nazi regime, because of course he was a Jewish Marxist, so he had a huge target painted on him. He writes this book called From Caligari, which is one of the films we'll talk about, to Hitler. And he comes up with this theory that you could have seen what was about to happen by following the films of 1920s Germany. He basically has this attitude that, you know, films, because they're made to be popular and be absorbed by a popular audience, and because they're a collective effort made by many people rather than one, are one of the greatest ways to measure the understanding of a society, this seismograph, if you will, of the culture. Um, and so in this book, he charts the evolution of films in Weimar Germany and comes to some conclusions. And I'm going to talk about his ideas and places where I agree with him, and places where I disagree with him. But Caligari to Hitler is really the formative text, not just of this presentation, but I might add of film studies. Uh, before this book, people really didn't take film studies seriously. Film studies was just you learned about how to use a camera. After this book, the idea of like understanding the psychology of a film or the cultural impact of a film becomes uh, a really baked into film studies and ever after uh, that's how we tend to look at films so very influential philosopher anyways let's go ahead and talk about the first movie i'm going to try to use original posters for all of the films so this is the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and it's the first big film that we're going to talk about. It was released in February of 1920, so just a year after uh, all of that crazy stuff that I was just talking about. Uh, and it was uh, written by Han Genovitz, who was a pacifist, Karl Meyer, who was a Jewish pacifist, and it was directed by uh, Robert Vina, uh, who was a Christian of Jewish descent, uh, and stars Werner Krauss and Conrad Veidt. Um, so this is a movie explicitly written by pacifists um, about, in many ways, their war experience. Uh, I, I think other than Karl Meyer, they were all veterans, um, and, and they really get into some interesting stuff. And it's often considered, especially by people like Roger Ebert, to have been the first real horror movie ever made. Uh, so what is this movie? Well, this movie is basically about, uh, on the left is Krauss, Werner Krauss, and on the right uh, is um, Conrad Veidt. 
Um, and so uh, Krauss plays the doctor and Veit plays the somnambulant. And what is that? Krauss is the doctor. He has found a man who is always asleep. Um, and he only wakes up when the doctor commands him to. And when he wakes up, he can see the future. And, and he brings him to a freak show. And, um, and everybody in town goes to the freak show. And uh, one of the people in the audience asks the somnambulant, when will I die? And the somnambulant says, you will not live to see the morning. And so that's the beginning of the movie. And I'm going to do my best not to spoil these movies, even though they came out 101 years ago, just because maybe you haven't seen them and they're all free on YouTube. And so you might have a great, you know, silent horror movie film festival lined up as soon as this talk is over. So uh, I won't try to spoil what happens, but um, this idea of the doctor running everything. So you can see him here. He's actually force feeding the man while he's sleeping, you know. Uh, and the poor somnambulant, uh, you know, causing death uh, to these people in this town really is an on-the-nose metaphor for what these pacifist veterans felt like they'd experienced in the First World War. They felt like they had just sleepwalked into joining the army and then were forced to do a bunch of things they would have never done otherwise. Uh, and so, you know, uh, when this movie continues, obviously, uh, at some point the somnambulant wakes up, realized he's been missing out on his whole life while he's been sleeping. And the first thing he does is see a woman, which he instantly, you know, desires. Uh, and so he captures the woman and takes her around the city. And then, uh, you know, a group of people have to run and try to save the woman. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that the way the movie is framed is that the somnambulant, even though he is like the monster of the film, is actually viewed very sympathetically. It's all put on the doctor. The doctor is the actual evil villain of the film. Uh, now, Krakauer loved this movie. This was like his favorite movie of the era. And he really thought that this was a good metaphor for how the German people had been led into the war and how you know, the only way to free themselves was to overthrow the doctor uh, and, and wake up. Uh, and so that was a really interesting uh, film for him. And he really loved it. He really passionately supported this film, except he hated the ending. So this is the part where I can't tell you how it ends, but oh boy, did he hate the ending of this movie. I personally think it's one of the greatest twist endings in all of film history. Uh, and so I don't want to spoil it, but it's a really good movie. Um, as far as these movies go, I think it's one of the ones that holds up the best throughout history. Um, and so he really thought it was a good movie right up until the end. And I might add, he blamed the ending on the UFA, UFA, as we'll call them for this, the United Film Artists of Germany. Uh, and UFA uh, was the biggest movie production company, not just in Germany, but in Europe. They were like the Disney of their day. And so he had a lot of issue with the way that they corporatized movies. Artists would come up with great ideas, and then the UFA would edit them so that they watered down any sort of revolutionary ideas that might be in the film. And, and of course, as you can imagine, a committed Marxist like Krakauer really hated that. Um, but you can see, again, here's the beginning of, of horror movies in Germany directly dealing with social issues. The other interesting thing about this film, and you might have noticed this in some of the previous slides, is the set design. Uh, so this is what's called German Expressionism. And the idea that the world is this sort of nightmare landscape where even just three people having a conversation on a street corner looks in this bizarre nightmare way. And this is style of filming is going to follow the, the German horror movies all the way through the 1920s. Uh, and so I just wanted to talk about it, show this frame from the film. I think it's a really, really good image that really shows what German expressionism is all about. So again, without um, spoiling the movie, uh, I think it's just a, a really good one. It's a great murder mystery. It's, it's a great psychological thriller. I think even now it holds up. I recommend it. So on to the next thing. Well, the next thing that happens is that, you know, a month after this movie comes out, you get the cap push. Push is just the German word for a coup. Uh, and this one was headed by Wolfgang Cap, which is why it's called the cap push. Um, so uh, in 1920, in March of 1920, a group of far-right extremists led by the Fry Corps, the very same people who had prevented the Spartacan Corps from turning Germany into a communist state, attempt to turn Germany into an authoritarian state. Um, and so they topple the Weimar government. The Weimar government has to flee to Dresden. They're actually not safe in Dresden. They then have to flee to Stuttgart. They send in the army uh, and, and the actual quote from the general, he looks at these you know, right-wing terrorists. He says, you know, uh, the Reichswehr, the army, does not fire on the Reichswehr. 
Uh, and so he doesn't do anything to actually stop this revolt. Uh, and so the Weimar government has to flee to Stuttgart. They wind up um, in Stuttgart, but at that moment, the, Reim, the Weimar government's headed by the Socialist Democratic Party, so they're a left-wing government, and they call on all of the unions to do a general strike and shut down the entire country. And it works. Um, the telegram operators don't send messages. Um, the newspaper men don't print newspapers. The railroad workers don't run the trains. And so as a result, not only can uh, the, the Fry Corps not actually do anything about their control of the country, they can't do anything at all. They can't even communicate with their members because they can't send a telegram or make a phone call. There's nothing they can do. Um, and so this general strike is extraordinarily effective and the cap push only lasts for five days. Nonetheless, that's still, you know, four revolutions in two years. And so that's really affecting the psyche of the country. Now, uh, Krakauer, just like his lament at the failed communist revolution of 1919, really hates that the general strike doesn't continue. He says, this was the moment when the, the, the people of this country, the workers of this country could have actually taken control of the country once they realized they were so powerful. I mean, there's millions of people in these fry corps, right? Once they realize they're so powerful that just by not working, they can stop this motivated force, this push, these people well-armed fry corps, uh, that was the moment they should have realized they could have lived in a whole new country in a whole new world. Um, and so uh, he's really angry about that. But then what makes him even angrier is that the Socialist Democratic Party, once they're able to retake control of the government, are extraordinarily lenient with the generals who had refused to fire on uh, the, the Fry Corps. And instead, uh, he uses the military to put down a bunch of communist revolutionaries. Uh, including the Ruhr Valley, where once the general strike is over, again, the workers say, well, we don't need to participate. If, if we're this powerful, we can just, you know, run the Ruhr Valley. But they've forced that down. And then in Bavaria, which is still, you know, uh, uh, at this point, I think, is the Bavarian Soviet Republic, um, they actually send in uh, the military and put that down as well. Uh, so uh, RIP, Bavarian Socialist State, you lasted about a year and a half, um, but it's it's uh, <laughs> time's up. and and this movement really falls apart because the uh, center left doesn't go along with the far left. At least that's Krakauer's opinion. I might have, this is a really interesting picture because it shows the Fry Corps uh, in the cap push. That's the first time that swastikas were ever put on a military uniform in Germany. That moment, that picture, and they just drew them on with paint and chalk. Uh, so that's really the beginning of what would eventually become the Nazi movement. So the next film comes out in October of 1920, just a couple months after uh, that, and it's called Der Golem, our Wien die Welt kam, which the golem, how he came into the world, uh, again, also made by the UFA. Uh, and so Paul Wegener uh, was the, uh, the director and also the star of this movie, uh, and it was written by a guy named Henrik Galeen. Uh, Henrik Galeen is gonna show up again, um, and Henrik Galeen uh, wrote this movie uh, and he is an interesting guy because he grew up in a Jewish family, but later turned to occultism. Uh, and so this movie is kind of a blend of the two things. So this is the opening shot of that film. And as you can see, it keeps with the impressionist modality of having these strange curved buildings, but it also has the stars in the sky. It's a very beautiful uh, opening shot, and the stars are about to align. What the Golem is actually about is about uh, a rabbi who is being oppressed or the Jewish people are being oppressed in Prague by the king of, the, of Prague, or actually the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and they're being oppressed, and so they build a clay monster. And this is an ancient, or I guess a medieval Jewish legend um, that they were just making a film of. And so they're being oppressed by this uh, king. They make a clay monster to save them. Uh, the, the clay monster eventually turns on them. Uh, and that's what the movie is about. Again, trying not to spoil a movie that came out 101 years ago. But they put this movie together. They brought in this really interesting guy uh, named Hans Pulzig, who is an architect. And he actually designed a lot of famous buildings around Europe, which are still standing to this day. But they brought him in to be the set designer. And he just made the Jewish ghetto uh, look uh, really interesting and really expressionistic and really beautiful. Um, but it is interesting because when you're watching the film, the Jews in the film, even though the, the story was written by a Jew and based on a Jewish legend, are very occultist in their outlook. 
So that opening scene just a frame ago is, you know, Rabbi, uh, the rabbi of the story um, doing uh, astrology, which is actually expressly forbidden in the Old Testament uh, and something that an Orthodox Jew would never take part in. Uh, an Orthodox Jew would also, by the way, never make a clay monster. But the idea that Jews are occultists, again, for Galen, he was a Jew and then he became an occultist. That's no big thing to him. But this sort of conflation of, of Jewish appearances with the otherworldly also serves to sort of other Jewish people in the mind. And this movie is a blockbuster. This movie, you know, sells out every movie theater is the number one movie in Germany for four weeks. And then it goes over to the U.S. and is the number one movie in the U.S. for four weeks. However, of course, because it features this incredible, that's the golem, because it features this incredibly strong Jewish protagonist, um, it's actually popular among Jewish people. Uh, and so it's not viewed as an anti-Jewish film. It's just a film that, while it puts Jews in the foreground, still gets so many things wrong about their culture um, that you have to wonder whether or not it did more harm than good. Although to be fair, any criticism I'm making of Der Golem right now, uh, if you just replace the word Jew with the word Native American, you could also make about the 1990s Disney classic Pocahontas. On the one hand, it puts their narrative front and center. On the other hand, it gets so many things wrong <laughs> that you wonder whether or not it did more harm than good. Um, and so, it fixes in the mind that you know Jews are magical, um, that Jews are occultists, that they're otherworldly, and that they're other. Uh, and I don't know if that was the intention of the people that wrote the film, but considering what an outbreak success it was, it is still part of the story of this film. And I might add, there's an undercurrent that the Jews are dangerous because, of course, the golem flips on the Jewish people themselves. And to be fair, that's no different than Frankenstein or Terminator or Jurassic Park. There's lots of movies where somebody makes a monster and then the monster turns on them. Uh, this is interesting because Paul Wegener, the director of the film also plays the golem. So he's, you know, this guy. Uh, and then that's Lydia Salmanova, uh, who is his Czech wife, who is the star of the film. She's the Jewish woman that, uh, you know, just like uh, Caligari's uh, somnambulant wakes up and instantly desires a woman. Uh, here, uh, the golem wakes up and instantly desires the rabbi's daughter and tries to run away with her. So kind of a similar plot. Um, but it's also interesting because as a little backstory, they were married. And so, you know, they, they did this together. But he actually wound up uh, uh, cheating on her with one of the other people in the cast. Uh, and so they divorced right after this film. And then the woman he cheated on her with um, was named uh, Greta Schroeder, who wound up becoming the star of the movie Nosferatu. So there's lots of weird connections there in old German Berlin uh, movie scene. Uh, so anyways, soon after this movie, uh, you get into 1921, 1922, uh, and then you get a whole other set of problems for Germany. You get the inflation crisis. They've just gotten the Reichsmark back under control uh, from 130 billion to one. They've got it back under control. And then all of a sudden in 1922, it takes off again. 1922, 1923, you have what's called the inflation crisis. And this time it's even worse. The Reichsmark goes from being, again, a reasonable amount to the dollar to being 4 trillion uh, marks to the dollar. So people's life savings are just completely wiped out in one go. Uh, this is a $5 billion mark, although Germans actually count a little bit differently than uh, English language does. So uh, the, the 5 billion mark is actually a 5 trillion mark in English. Um, and so uh, this 5 trillion mark note is actually worth about $1. Uh, so as you can imagine, the economy has just completely gone head over heels. It's just a disaster for everybody involved. But what's also interesting about this period is that it makes movies especially valuable because you can make them overseas where you can get paid in real money and then distribute them overseas. So if you make, if your movie's a breakout success in another country, then you don't have to rely on an income of marks, which the value is just fluctuating massively on a day-to-day -day basis. If you make a bunch of money in dollars, you can just keep the money in dollars or francs or uh, British crowns. And, and so movies become a huge uh, touchstone for the German industry because they're actually one of those things that they can make money from abroad and bring money in. So in this light, we then get to the hero of the presentation, Nosferatu. So Nosferatu was released in March 4th, 1922. It was written again by Henrik Galin, who wrote uh, Der Golem. It was directed by F.W. Murnau, who I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and it starred Max Schreck as the vampire, Greta Schroeder, who I just talked about, as 
the uh, the the damsel in distress, the Mina character, uh, Ellen, as she's called in the movie, and then Gustav von Wegenheim, uh, who plays Hutter, who's the Jonathan Harker character. And if you can't tell by the fact that I'm changing names around a little bit, that's because it's based on Dracula, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So this is the main movie we're here to talk about. So let's talk about how it was made. So two guys, Alban Grau and Henrik Galeen, get together to make this film. Uh, they're both occultists, and they have this desire to make a film about the occult. Um, Alban Grau uh, and Henrik Galeen had both served in World War I. Alban Grau uh, had served really frontline duty on the Eastern Front. Uh, and indeed, uh, these are some of, this actually is beautiful. This is one of his original drawings for how he wanted the movie to look. And as you can see, they wound up doing a pretty good job. Um, so Grau uh, had been a set designer. Uh, Galeen had written the script for Dirk Golem. Uh, they were both occultists. Um, Grau was stationed in Serbia during World War I, uh, and Grau came across a man in Serbia who claimed that uh, his father had become a vampire. So Grau's just a soldier. He's listening to the story. Um, so the man tells a story about a string of murders. Uh, they go to his father's grave. The grave has an empty casket. Uh, uh, they return the next day, and his father's corpse is back, but it's got pointy fangs. And so they actually impale his father's body and burn the corpse. And so this is a story that this Serbian man is telling uh, Alvin Grau. And this fixture in his mind of this vampire story in combination with his World War I service stays. It lasts. Um, and uh, Grau later says in no uncertain terms that, you know, suffering and grief have shaken men's hearts uh, and have little by little suspended their desire to understand the cause of the monstrous events that had depleted the world like a cosmic vampire, drinking the blood of millions and millions of men. So he really has this on the nose interpretation of the war as a vampire. And you know, when you combine that with his interest in the occult, he really has this desire to make a vampire movie. So he finds in him a director, a guy named F.W. Murnau. Uh, Murnau is a fascinating guy. Uh, I could to talk about him all day. I'll try to get the basics though. Uh, Murnau was an enlisted man. He fought on the front, uh, the Eastern Front in World War I, initially uh, survived the trenches and eventually became a member of the German Air Force. Um, and he was, uh, he was up in the skies one day in 1917 when he got shot down. He got shot down over Switzerland, but of course Switzerland wanted nothing to do with any of these people. So they just put him in jail. Uh, and he spent all of 19, or the rest of 1917 and all of 1918 in prison until the war was over. Uh, and so he had this very interesting war uh, career. But what's perhaps also interesting about F.W. Murnau is that he was a gay man. And he was gay at a time in which uh, that was largely unacceptable. But of course, 1920s Germany was very different from before 1920s Germany. And so a lot of gay people were coming out of the closet and actually trying to campaign for gay rights. Uh, Murnau survives the war, but his lover, a man named Hans Ehrenbaum de Galle, uh, was killed in World War I. And when the war is over, Murnau actually goes to Degale's parents and asks to move in with them and live in his old lover's like childhood room. And that's where he lives when he's making Nosferatu, is in his ex-lover's, sadly dearly departed lover's house with his parents. Um, and I might add on top of that, uh, Degale, uh, Ehrenbaum, Hans Ehrenbaum Degale, his lover, was the son of a Jewish man. Um, and so Murnau had this really interesting uh, life in regards to uh, Judaism and grief and war and homosexuality at a time in which all of these issues are going to be huge. Um, so Murnau gets together with Grau, uh, and they also get together actually with Janowitz, who had written The Cabinet of Dr. Galligari, and they make a movie called Der Janiskopf, starring Conrad Veidt, who was the Sonambulant, and Dr. Caligari, um, and uh, they get together to make this film. Well, what is this film? This film is actually um, a complete ripoff of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, they just stole it. And of course, this is like the 1920s and that book came out in the 1880s. So imagine like ripping off a hit novel from the 1980s now and just not getting, just, just not caring and, and getting away with it. You know, they didn't get sued. Uh, the family of Robert Sue Louis Stevenson didn't sue them. And it was a huge success. And of course, it's a huge success right when they really need a success because the economy is in the tanks. Uh, and so they decide to try to do it again. Uh, and so they, they rip off the novel Dracula, 
which again just came out in 1897. So you have to imagine somebody now ripping off a novel from the 1990s and just again thinking they could get away with it, like they wouldn't have to pay royalties or anything. Um, so they do. Well, they don't want to work within the UFA because they hate the UFA. They think it stifles artists. So they formed their own production company and it's called Prana. Prana is the Sanskrit word for life force. So again, you don't want to necessarily think about occultism as being the same as like a modern, like neo-pagan. Occultism is just a blend of everything. There's a little bit of Buddhism and Hinduism. There's a little bit of, of paganism for sure. Uh, there's a lot of um, like transcendentalism and uh, uh, surrealism and spiritualism. Uh, they're really obsessed with trying to contact the dead, which of course, especially after this period of mass death, from World War I and the influenza pandemic is a big deal. They're just always trying to contact the dead. Um, and so they start Prana with the sole intention of only making films about the occult. Um, and so that's their goal. Uh, and in the middle of making this movie or right at the end while they're editing the film, a series of things happen in the occult world. So Albert Grau had originally been invited to join a group called the Ordo Templis Orientis, which was a German offshoot of a lot of these other occultist movements. Um, and, and it was originally headed by a man named Aleister Crowley. So Aleister Crowley had started uh, a huge occultist movement in England following his belief that uh, on a tour in Egypt that the actual Egyptian gods had contacted him and given him a prophecy that he was to lead mankind into the age of Horus. Um, it should be noted, Aleister Crowley was not himself a Satanist, but his belief that the primary piece of law that was given to him by the Egyptian gods was that instead of do unto others as you'd have them do it to you, it should be do as thou wilt. That became a huge influence on uh, later Satanic movements, uh, especially like Anton LaVey's Church of Satan. Um, but Aleister Crowley himself was not a Satan. He, he was really uh, an occultist like these other guys. And so he started a group called the Ordo Templi Orientis, um, and, and he was invited to Germany by people like uh, Alvin Grau. Alvin Grau was actually going to make a documentary about Aleister Crowley when he showed up, but things went south fast. Um, and so they had a terrible time in their trip. They did not get along at all. Um, and Crowley attempted to take control of Grau's lodge um, from a guy named Heinrich uh, Tranker, who was actually the head of the lodge, um, but failed uh, because they wouldn't let him. Uh, and, and Tranker actually went to the government and tried to get Crowley deported because he was on an improper visa. Uh, and so this really didn't sit well with a lot of the people in the Ordo Templi Orientis. Uh, and then there was another group, uh, he was the master chair of the Pansophical Lodge of the Orient, a lot of Orientalism going on here. Um, and so the whole lodge fell apart in Germany and they started their own lodge, which is that symbol I showed on the last side next to the Prana Film logo, called the Fraternitas Saturni. Uh, the Brotherhood of Saturn. And so um, now that uh, Tranker and Grau have formed their own lodge and they've kicked out Aleister Crowley, um, their occultist ambitions uh, continue, uh, but in a different form. And as we'll see, they, they don't turn out as well as they'd hoped. Um, so that's what's going on in the making of this film. These are the guys that made this film. That's the film they made or how, how they made it. But okay, now that we've talked about how they make the film, what is the film? So let's first off start with the title. The word Nosferatu does not appear in any language until the novel Dracula. The novel Dracula is the first time the word Nosferatu is ever written down. Bram Stoker wrote it down. It's believed that Bram Stoker um, got it from another source, probably his uh, Transylvanian um, uh, legends book and then just misspelled it. Uh, it either comes, it might come from the Romanian word nesuferit, which means troublesome, or my personal favorite, it might come from the Greek nosophoros, which means plague bringer. Uh, and this is another one of Grau's original uh, drawings right here for how he wanted the film to look. Um, so that's where the title comes from. So they changed it because, again, they had just wholesale ripped off the novel Dracula. They just changed the names of the characters and the ending, very different ending in the movie Nosferatu than from the, the book uh, Dracula. But as I said, it's taken from the novel Dracula. So scene for scene, I mean, like, for instance, if you're familiar, there's a scene in the novel Dracula, I believe it's chapter seven, actually, where uh, one by one, Dracula picks off everybody on a boat called the Demeter um, in, the, in the movie. That's exactly what happens. It's, it's the same story. 
Uh, Nosferatu picks off people one by one on a boat and it creates one of the most iconic shots in film history. I love this, this shot. Um, and so they're taking things from the, uh, from the novel Nosferatu, putting them in film, hoping they'll get away with it. And they changed the vampire from Count Orlog, from Count Dracula to Count Orlog. Harker is Hutter, Mina is Ellen, uh, Van Helsing is Bull Bear. I mean, they're really not trying hard here. Um, and so they're doing this point to point in the film. What's also interesting is that they wanted to keep the German expressionist motif going, but um, Murnau is a huge fan of nature. He's a, he's a real naturalist. And so he wants everything to be natural. Um, and so instead of building these elaborate sets, he just goes to real places that look weird and film them. So these are real houses in the German city of Lübeck, but they're actually slanted in real life because they were poorly constructed. Um, and so um, this is where Nosferatu makes his house in these slanted houses, but they're real houses. Uh, and so they're keeping the German expressionist motif, but using natural settings. And indeed, um, Murnau views this as an opportunity to do like a nature documentary. And so there's scenes in the film where they do a slow motion filming of a Venus flytrap eating a fly. It's really one of the more interesting scenes in the film. And it's actually just because uh, Murnau loved nature so much and wanted to basically have a miniature nature documentary in the middle of his vampire movie. Uh, there's another great scene where they rented a hyena from the Berlin Zoo and had it chase a bunch of horses to scare the hell out of them. Um, I might add, it's really like the horses were in one paddock and the hyena was in another, so it's not like the horses were in any danger, uh, just in case you were wondering whether or not any animals were harmed in the making of this film. Yes, that one fly, but no horses. Um, and so he, uh, he tries to work in this nature documentary. However, as I've said, the, uh, the experience of these guys really traumatized from World War I. Uh, they're making a movie about the vampire as a, a, a war metaphor, I think. Uh, and I might add, Krakauer really agrees. Krakauer really loves this film uh, and, and views it as the Nosferatu, the vampire, is the tyrant. And the people come together uh, to try to overthrow the tyrant. And his one big complaint is that, uh, just like in the novel, it's a small group of people fighting uh, the vampire rather than a people's movement to overthrow the vampire. Um, he thinks that it should have been you know, a huge mass. The whole town should have gotten together and fought the vampire. Uh, and that's where he again thinks it fails because he thinks that the movies of the era don't show the strength that people have in mass movements. They're always focused on individual hero stories instead of the larger will of the people. Uh, and also, and what's really interesting, and this is sort of an aside, but along with the war metaphor, there's a very clear plague metaphor. When Nosferatu shows up, he brings the rats, the rats bring the plague. Uh, and so there's even this great, this is one of the stills from the English translation of the film. And this is in German as well, if you watch in the original German where the mayor makes an announcement that any ill or plague-stricken people should not be seen on the streets uh, and cannot uh, be taken to the hospital. They must remain in their homes uh, because, you know, th that's what they did during the flu pandemic. They had to stay in their homes. There's actually a scene where somebody says, you know, stay in quarantine, stay in your homes. And it's absolutely fascinating, uh, especially having, you know, come through the COVID pandemic, that this was still present in their minds at this time. What's old is new. Uh, and there's this great scene uh, where they're carrying coffins down the street from all the people that have been killed by the plague. And of course, they've really been killed by the vampire, but they just believe it's a disease. Um, and, and this scene would have been so familiar to the people of Germany in that time, you know, watching, you know, day after day, people coming out of the hospitals, coming out of their homes in coffins. And so you can really see the tragedy of the, the war and of the, the, the flu pandemic worked into this film. So although it's a, a fantastical film, it is very real to the people that made it. And, uh, and so that's what's actually in the film. That's the basic plot of the film. You know, it's Dracula, Jonathan Harker goes to Dracula's castle to sell him some land. Dracula comes to live in the house that he sold him. He winds up killing people throughout the city, innocent people, uh, and then a small group get together to fight the vampire away. Uh, although again, I will try not to spoil this movie that came out 99 years ago. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. I think it, it's a good one, it holds up. Uh, so that's how it was made, that's what was in it. Now, what was its reception? What happened when it came out? Well, the first thing is that they threw a ball for it. They threw this giant ball for it premiered on March 4th, 1922. And when they premiered it, they premiered it in the zoo. Uh, so this is actually the Berlin Zoo. They have, this is what their zoo looks like, it's just extraordinary. Um, they have a giant screen come out 
They had uh, Max Shrek, uh, who played the vampire, um, give a speech at the beginning. They had an intermission with dancers. Um, they had a costume party. People showed up in costume, although very specific costumes. You dressed like you were an 1830s German. It's not, it's not like everybody brought their own costume. I'm dressed as a Ghostbuster right now. As you can see, I wanted to dress up for my Halloween lecture. Um, and, uh, but you know, you couldn't show up dressed as a Ghostbuster. It, you had to dress up as an 1830s German. So that was the costume party because that's when the movie takes place in 1838 in Germany. Or actually, technically, in a German town in Sweden, which is also an interesting aspect. Um, and indeed, the party cost more than the movie. So when they threw this gigantic party, they actually uh, spent a ton of their budget just on the party. And so initially, the reviews were good. The reception was good. But of course, what happened, as I said earlier, that inflation crisis. So all of the money they made in Germany, all the money they spent just goes down the hole. And then whatever money they make in Germany, um, you know, it just is worthless. They're hoping the movie is going to be a big international success. But of course, they wholesale ripped off the entire story from the novel Dracula only, you know, 25 years after the book came out. So Bram Stoker died in, uh, in right before World War I, 1912, 1913, I want to say. Yeah, I think 1912. And, but his wife, Florence Balcombe Stoker, was still alive. And, you know, Bram Stoker's book sold well, but she's still just struggling to make ends meet off of the royalties from the book. So when she finds out that they've attempted to make this hit movie in Germany without paying her at all, uh, you know, she's livid and she gets the Writers Guild together uh, and they sue the pants off of Prana Films. And I might add, they don't actually like get any money from Prana, but Prana between the inflation crisis and their inability to show the movie in a bunch of places because of this lawsuit um, and their ongoing legal fees, it goes bankrupt. The whole studio just goes bankrupt. They only ever made one movie. That movie was Nosferatu. That was it. Um, Eventually, Florence Balcom Stoker wins the case, but it's many years later, and um, and she doesn't ever see a penny because Prana has gone bankrupt. So she actually orders the film to be destroyed. And the only reason we're able to watch this film today is because a couple of movie theaters didn't go along with it. And it's really interesting because uh, the film eventually has a second life in 1929, uh, and, uh, and and its premiere in New York where you know, somebody just saved an English language version, played it in New York, the film catches fire, it becomes hugely popular, and then it inspires a revival of Dracula, and then they make Todd Browning's Dracula in 1931, which actually does get film rights and, and, and gets the Stoker family their long overdue uh, paycheck, uh, and makes the novel in turn super popular. So you know, she fought this huge legal battle with them, and I think she was justified, because uh, they did just steal her husband's novel. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it was thanks to this movie that the novel actually became the eventual classic that it is now. Uh, so uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, that's the release, uh, the making, the, the film, the release of the film. Okay, so now the real fundamental question of this presentation. Could you have seen the Nazis coming from watching this film? Uh, this, of course, was Krakauer's theory in his book, From Caligari to Hitler. He gives Nosferatu a free pass because he thinks it's a film about fighting tyranny. Not a completely free pass because it doesn't admolish or acknowledge uh, people's movements, but a free pass nonetheless. However, other authors don't. So the question is, was Nosferatu an anti-Semitic film? Did it have anti-Semitic overtures? And so this, for instance, is a side-by-side. -side. That's uh, the vampire, Count Orlock, in profile. This is an anti-Semitic cartoon that was published in 1919 advocating the stabbed in the back myth that um, the, the German army lost the World War I not because of all these other things, but because the Jews had secretly plotted against them and made their lives miserable. And as you can see, the, the actual vampire creature kind of looks like an anti-Semitic stereotype with the very large nose and the, and the forehead and all this other stuff. And, and I think a lot of people that were, and again, this cartoon came out before uh, the movies. So, you know, a lot of people would be looking at this and saying, oh, this is so obvious. But on the other hand, the whole reason they hired Max Schreck was because according to Murnau, Schreck was the ugliest man I'd ever seen. So to agree, this is just what he looks like. Um, bat ears are fake. Uh, the shaved head is fake. The makeup is fake. Um, the nose has a, is a little bit elongated. The teeth are obviously fake. 
But, you know, this to him is just a monstrous looking man. There is no desire for them to make an anti-Semitic film. Again, the writer, the original writer of the film was Jewish. Uh, um, Murnau had been in love with the Jewish man. Um, he himself was a gay man. There's nothing about any of these guys which screamed fascism. So then the question becomes, did they make an anti-Semitic movie by accident? And this is where uh, a really interesting uh, author named Patrick Hogan says, yes, in the strongest possible terms, they did. So I want to actually start with this character, Nock. Um, Nock is played by a, a real, uh, an actor named Alexander Grunock, which I think is interesting. And Nock is the real estate agent who's in league with Nosferatu to try to basically um, you know, feed Hutter, the, the Jonathan Harker character, to Hutter. And so, uh, or to Count Orlock. Uh, and so it is interesting that sort of the villainous uh, real estate salesman is actually uh, played by Alexander Gnock, who was a Jewish actor from Poland. Um, and so they were really good friends, by the way. You know, Murnau just thought he was given a really good actor, a really good part. But the one guy that's played by a Jewish actor in the movie is you know, the shysty real estate agent that's trying to swindle somebody. And I think that that has a huge knock on effect. Now, what's also interesting is that towards the end of the film, um, the people think that knock is the cause of the plague. And so they blame him and they chase him down in a lynch mob and try to get him. Uh, again, no spoilers. I won't tell you what happens next, but uh, that is seen as definitely played for sympathy where knock is viewed as an insane man who's been betrayed by Count Orlock, uh, just the same way Renfield was betrayed by Dracula. And, and so he's a, a character of sympathy who's been unjustly targeted by a mob. So from a, a strictly filmic standpoint, the text of the film would say, no, this is wrong. Like they're treating this victim uh, poorly as a lynch mob. But from the point of view of a lot of other people, okay, your one Jewish character is a swindler and then the mob goes after him and it's kind of justified because he actually is in league with the vampire. Uh, Hogan goes a step further and says, that when you actually look at that document that he was holding, the letter that he sends to uh, uh, Orlok or Orlok's letter to Nock, uh, you can see a bunch of symbols on it. Now, some of them are occultist symbols like Nockian symbols and Crowleyan symbols, but some of them are Jewish letters, including an outright Star of David right here. Um, and then a bunch of Hebrew letters up here, uh, including Beth, uh, Aleph, Gimel, and Yod. Um, and so there's this formation in the mind of the German audience. Uh, and again, these films were much clearer when they were released. They've, they've just lost some of their uh, film quality over time. But a German audience would see this and see the Star of David on the letter and, and just be like, oh, they're Jews. And so to him, for Hogan, he's like, this is you know anti-Semitic whether they wanted it to be or not. Now again, Henrik Lean, who wrote this film, who was a Jewish occultist, to him, being an occultist wasn't a bad thing. So, you know, there's no, <laughs> there's no desire to, to make the Jews look bad by making them look occult because that for him is fine. What's wrong with being a Jewish occultist? I'm a Jewish occultist is what Galeen would have said. Um, however, for the minds of most people watching this film, the people trading in occult symbols are the vampire and the swindler. So if those are the guys sharing occult symbols, then why would you, uh, why would you frame that as a positive? These are obviously the, the villains of the movie. So, you know, in this moment, there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, who is it, who's, who's making the best point here? Siegfried Krakauer, who is himself a Jewish German, did not view this film as anti-Semitic. Uh, other people, uh, like Hogan, like many other people, do view this film as anti-Semitic. So the question isn't, what was the author's intention? Because I don't think their intention was to make an anti-Semitic film, but what were the knock-on effects of this film? So as I said, the movie didn't do as well as it could have. It wasn't super popular. So how much influence could it have really had uh, in terms of Nazi ideology? Like were Nazis watching this film and were they inspired by it? And the answer to that question is a hard yes. One of the people at the premiere of Nosfratu on March 4th, 1922 was Julius Streicher or Julius Streicher. Uh, and he would go on to found the the magazine slash newspaper Der Sturmer. And Der Sturmer, the storm, uh, was the Nazi propaganda rag of choice. It was how they got their message out. And Julius Stryker wasn't just at the premiere. He saw the movie over and over and over again. He loved Nosferatu. It was his favorite film. And the idea of 
not the war as vampire, which was Grau's intent, but the Jew as vampire is how Julius Stryker took the film and then proceeded to work vampire metaphors and even direct references to the movie Nosferatu into issue after issue after issue of Der Sturmer. So um, <laughs> that's how it goes. They made this movie, they put it out into the world, and it becomes part and parcel of Nazi propaganda, even though I don't think for a second that that was their intention. So this is, for instance, one of Stryker's cartoons. As you can see, you have the vampire, he's doing that. It's the Jewish press is what it says at the bottom, and then they're feeding uh, this German, this poison stew, and obviously they're making the stereotypical Jew as vampire face. Um, and so this is straight from the magazine right after the movie came out. I mean, you, it's, you can't get more on the nose than this. Um, and I do think that um, the filmmakers were not trying to do this, but I, there is also an argument to be made that regardless of your intentions, you do have to take you know, stock of the culture that you're in. You have to look at the world around you and say, uh, what what are we doing? How will our movie be received? You know, when I Am Legend came out, the whole plot of I Am Legend, or at least the, the founding start, the first five minutes of I Am Legend is, they invent a miracle cure. The cure turns people into vampires, right? That's the plot of I Am Legend. When it came out in 2006, nobody thinks anything about it. It's just an interesting premise for how you could have a vampire apocalypse, right? If you made that movie now, you would basically be making anti-vaccine propaganda. You would know that's what you were doing. So if you make it before, that's one thing, but if you make it afterwards, you know, now you're really actually playing with fire and you should realize that you are playing with fire. Well, again, they're in the middle of a lot of struggles, a lot of crises, but you know, one day the communists are overthrowing the government, the next day the fascists are overthrowing the government. Uh, who's to say that, you know, this film would be interpreted as anti-Semitic propaganda? Well, the problem with that argument is that, um, in the same time period, you do have this huge rise of anti-Semitism. So Walter Rathenau uh, is assassinated in June 1922, so just a couple months, like three months after the film came out, the Jewish German foreign secretary is assassinated. You see, in 1920, uh, uh, a very famous uh, anti-Semitic propaganda magazine that was published in Russia uh, called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, uh, which is a book that claims to be the secret notes from a meeting of Jewish leaders about how they're going to control the world. Um, it's totally fictitious. It's totally made up. Um, it's just it's just bad, you know, anti-Semitic fan fiction. But it was released in Russia, and then it gets translated into German in 1920. It becomes a very commonly bought book, not, maybe not a bestseller, but it is a lot of people buy it. And Walter Rathenau um, is the German foreign minister. He is a Jewish man. And he's assassinated by two right-wingers um, who believe that he is actually one of the elders of Zion, secretly plotting to control the world. And so this is all going on when this movie is being released. And indeed, um, in 1923, a year after the release of the film, you have the Beer Hall push. Um, and this is an attempt by the, 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 at this point, the actual Nazis to overthrow the government of Bavaria and Munich 2,000 Nazis gather uh, to try to overthrow the Bavarian government, which is now, of course, under the general federal government of Germany. Um, they fail, uh, but it results in 16 dead Nazis and four dead police officers. Hitler gets wounded. He escapes. He's found at a farmhouse and arrested two days later. He's put in jail. That's when he chooses to write Mein Kampf, is in prison. Um, and, uh, and so German society, and this is, again, all in the middle of, you know, uh, five trillion Deutschmarks to the dollar. Um, so, I mean, this is all in the middle of this, this horrible period for Germany. So what's going on here? Can the center hold? Will society collapse? Well, thankfully, they managed to elect as chancellor this guy, Gustav Stresemann. Now, Stresemann is not a perfect man. He also had a lot of prejudices. Um, he, he hated the French. Um, he, he was very strongly anti-communist. He had a lot of his own personal prejudice. But he is sort of a center-left moderate figure. And more importantly, he's like a financial genius. Um, and so he's brought on as the chancellor in 1923. Uh, and he's only the chancellor for 100 days. And he's sort of one of these fun, like, um, uh, when German people ask me who's my favorite chancellor, I often say Gustav Stresemann, um, because he was only chancellor for 100 days. 
Um, but uh, he is kind of uh, an interesting sort of in the weeds guy, but he winds up being hugely influential in German society um, because in that hundred days, and then he becomes the foreign minister immediately after his hundred days as chancellor, uh, he's able to negotiate the Dawes plan. And the Dawes plan uh, is, is uh, Senator Dawes uh, comes up with this idea in the US where they're going to give Germany money. Germany is then going to repay their war debts from World War I that was in the, the Treaty of Versailles to the French and the British. And then the French and the British repay their, um, their war debts to the United States, which loaned them a bunch of money in the early part of the war. And then that's it. It's just a big circle of money. And it's all free. Like the US gives money uh, to Germany, which then gives it to France and uh, Britain, which then gives it back to the US. So no dollars are actually lost in the process. But as a result, it stabilizes the German economy. The inflation crisis ends, and 1924 to 1929 is often thought of as like the golden age of the Weimar Republic. So uh, thanks to Gustav Stresemann, uh, he's only chancellor for 100 days, although he is foreign minister through successive governments for the next you know, five, six years. Um, so very important figure in 1920s Germany. He also wins the Nobel Peace Prize in 1926, which I think is really interesting. Um, so he stabilizes the German economy. Now, this is where things get interesting because, of course, uh, Krakauer argues that in this moment of stability, this golden age of the Weimar Republic, this was the moment to try to make really revolutionary films to really get people to think. Um, but that's not really what happens. And so our next big film, as I said, Prana has fallen. Uh, and so uh, poor F.W. Murnau has to go and work for uh, Ufa. Uh, he doesn't like working for Ufa, but at least they give him some, uh, some freedom to make what movies he wants to make. So he decides to make Goethe's Faust. So 1926, directed by F.W. Murnau, based on Goethe's Faust, starring Emil Jennings as Mephisto and Gusta Ekman as Faust. Uh, this is the novel of Dr. Faust, uh, sells his soul to the devil, um, uh, and for youth and, and hot women and, and, and all that good stuff. So he makes that into a movie. Here's what's interesting. First and foremost, the actual plot strays wildly from Goethe's Faust. Faust sells his soul not for, for women and money and youth, but actually because the city is beset by a plague and he wants to find a cure for the plague. So again, that influenza pandemic coming all the way to 1926, still very fresh in the mind of F.W. Murnau. So this is a picture of Mephisto releasing the plague onto the city. Beautiful shot. Now, uh, Murnau loved to shoot outside, but Ufa hated shooting outside. So they made him make sets. But once he was put in charge of making sets, he made really beautiful sets. And I would argue in some ways, this movie is actually much more uh, scenic and interesting picture than Nosferatu, but it's, it's still really beautiful. Uh, I also love, as I said, they had to make sets of this actually behind the scenes, them trying to hose down the poor guy in the costume because he's so hot under the light. They had to hose him down to keep him hydrated so he wouldn't collapse and fall on top of the set. Um, but it was initially released. It did really well overseas, did well in England, well in France, well in the US. It did terribly in Germany. Why did it do terribly in Germany? Because it strayed from the novel. And so Germans really wanted a German film that was through the German tradition that didn't stray from German uh, uh, legends. And because he strayed from the novel, uh, it was not received well. And so Krakauer says, oh, this is actually a sign of things to come. This insistence on cultural purity is actually a sign of bad things to come. And so um, I will say, though, what's also really interesting about this film is that, of course, Faust sells his soul to get a cure. But then when he gives the cure to the public, they hate him because he sold his soul to the devil and they don't uh, uh, trust him. They fear him. And so Faust is treated uh, like garbage. And so then he says, well, if they're not going to accept my cure, the least I can do is become young <laughs> and go after hot women. Um, and so Miss Bisto gives him uh, the youth and beauty and he gives him whatever he wants. But what's interesting is that when he decides to make Mephisto or to make Faust young, the way he does it is by covering uh, Mephisto with a magic cloth and then burning down his library. And so this is a screenshot of the film of Mephisto burning the library of Faust. Um, and so the idea that burning books gives Faust his, his strength uh, and that this is an evil thing to do. Burning books is evil and it gives evil people strength. Uh, it's very interesting that this is happening in 1926 before the Nazis rise to power. And indeed, I think of the Heinrich Heine quote, when they burn books, 
they will also ultimately burn people or where first they burn books, then they will burn people. Um, uh, Heine says that way back in the 1800s, um, but indeed this movie ends with a series of, of uh, burnings at the stake. So in the beginning of the movie, they burn books. At the end of the movie, they burn people. Uh, again, trying not to spoil a movie that came out you know, uh, 95 years ago. So he's working for Ufa. Ufa at that time is still mostly a free studio. Again, Krakauer would, would criticize them for being a little too conservative, but eventually Ufa gets uh, purchased by uh, this business titan, Alfred Hugenberg. Uh, so Hugenberg uh, buys uh, Ufa in 1927. And if the original question was, could you have predicted the rise of fascism by watching the films of the 1920s? All you really need to know is this. This predicts the rise of fascism. Alfred Hugenberg is a dyed in the wool fascist. Um, he doesn't officially join the Nazi party, which is interesting, but he is actually a member of a number of those pushes I talked about earlier, including an attempted push even like the year before. Um, and so he explicitly buys UFA and it's the, Europe's largest film studio. And he does it as a political move instead of a business move. He has no interest in films. Um, and he actually says two newspapers and he buys a bunch of newspapers as well. And then releases to the newspapers that he's bought UFA. And he says he's bought UFA to prevent Republicans, Jews, and internationalists from making any more films at UFA. So that's his explicit goal. The only reason he bought this uh, film studios is to keep Republicans, Jews, and internationalists from making movies in Germany. That's it. Uh, and so as you can imagine, a lot of the guys that have been making films uh, get really sick of this and they leave. Murnau goes to Hollywood. He goes to America. He decides to make his life in California. A lot of other people do. And believe me, if they don't in 1927, they do later. So with the idea that he doesn't want any Republicans and Jews and internationalists, and Republicans here being a small R, uh, people that supported the Weimar Republic uh, in Germany, uh, somebody who supported the Republic was a Republican. Uh, it's not, no relation to the American political party. Um, so the, the first big movie that comes out under the new UFA, which comes out just like a month after he buys the film, is actually, uh, buys the studio, is actually Metropolis by Fritz Long. And Metropolis, uh, directed by Fritz Long, written by Thea von Harbo, starring uh, um, Alfred Abel and Bridget Helm, uh, is, is the story of a futuristic society. So this is one of the most beautiful films ever made. The sets on this are extraordinary. Um, and so it takes place in the year 2100. Um, and it's about the society in which the rich live these lives of fabulous wealth and technology and the poor live in these subterranean layers underneath these skyscrapers idling away their lives at work. And so on the surface, it seemed like an actual pro-labor movie, a uh, very pro-communist movie. You know, look at how bad these, uh, these bosses treat their workers. But in fact, the plot of it goes in a slightly different direction. So this is the main character. Um, his name is Frieder, and he's actually the son of the, the, the CEO of, of Metropolis, the guy who runs the whole city. Uh, the name of Metropolis in the movie is actually New Babylon, but there's that. Um, so he goes down and in a weird like sort of episode of Undercover Boss, he pretends to be one of the workers and work a day's shift. And of course, he witnesses workers literally dying of exhaustion and he, he, uh, he becomes hallucinatory and actually sees them being fed to the, the pagan god Moloch. Um, and, and he's like, this is so evil. Our system is so evil. We build an entire society on this evil treatment of our workers. We have to do something about it. And so there's this rebellion, except the rebellion in the movie is shown to be a stupid rebellion. The workers rise up, but they're, it's bad. It's actually framed in the film as a bad thing that they're trying to rise up uh, very explicitly. And the film ends with it. And this is one of the film movies I do have to spoil, but I promise I'm not spoiling everything. I haven't even talked about the robot. Um, so Frieder brings the head of the rebellion over here together with his father, and says the head, his father, and the hands, the workers, want to join together, but they don't have the heart to do it. Oh, mediator, show them the way to each other. The mediator between the head and the hands must be the heart. And on the surface, this seems like, okay, yeah, the heart should combine that in the hands. The, 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 the bosses should have empathy for the workers, and that's a good thing. And well, wouldn't it be great if we all had more empathy for each other? And and, and wouldn't it be such a nice world? Um, but what it's actually 
uh, Krakauer argues, what it's actually saying is that workers' revolutions are dumb, people power is dumb, and in fact, uh, this movie is just trying to convince people to sit down and shut up and wait for, you know, some sort of messianic figure to, to bring about uh, more empathetic bosses, to melt the hearts of these CEOs and, 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 and all this other stuff. And so that's, that's Krakauer's uh, argument against the film. Uh, I'll go a step further, actually, and say that this phrase, the mediator between the head and the hands must be the heart, literally becomes Nazi propaganda. Metropolis was um, Joseph Goebbels and Adolf Hitler's favorite movie. They watched it together all the time. They loved this film. And later on in Nazi propaganda, they actually used this exact phrase, the mediator between the head and the hands must be the heart, except Hitler casts himself in the Frieder role and makes himself um, the heart that combines the, the head and the hands. Um, so, you know, this movie is really just pure Hugenberg propaganda. Um, initially, it seems like a very communist film. And I might add, there are lots of people who would watch this film, not think anything about it, and think this is a pro-worker movie. I don't see how any fascist could possibly get anything out of this other than that they're wrong and the workers of the world should unite. Um, but that's not how the movie was received at the time at all. And so this is a really interesting film because I think it's gone on. Its reputation has been rehabilitated since then because uh, Fritz Long became a committed anti-fascist, uh, and, and, and we'll talk about that uh, in the next film, but it, at the time that it came out, it was indeed uh, rife for Nazi propaganda. Um, and so Ufo releases this, it's a hit, but not as big as a hit as it could be because the next thing that comes out is the jazz singer, and so now nobody wants to watch silent movies, they all want to watch sound movies. So the next big movie uh, that Fritz Long makes is M. Now, Fritz Long can't get M made in UFA because it's too anti-fascist. He he's, feels terrible about Metropolis being used in the way that it was. And so he desires to make Metropolis, uh, or, or sorry, to unmake Metropolis and make a profoundly anti-fascist film. So he makes this movie M. And M is a fascinating film, although also written by Taya von Harbo, his wife, and starring an actor named Peter Lorre. So what is M about? Oh, sorry. First off, he has to film it from uh, another organization called Nero Films, uh, which is outside of UFA because he can't work inside of UFA anymore because Hugenberg is too overbearing and too editorial and too fascistic. And so M is actually a very disturbing movie. It, this is a horror movie with a capital H um, about a serial killer who kills children. Um, and and that's how the movie starts. This is one of the opening, I think the opening eight minutes of this film hold up with anything that has ever been made in cinema. It is actually genuinely scary, even now, even in modern times. Uh, I watched it uh, yesterday, actually, trying to get back into these old movies. I've been watching them uh, over the month of October and I, I finally finished M last night. And it, it, the opening eight minutes of this film are really something else. Um, and so it's the story of the serial killer. And it is, by the way, the first movie ever made about a serial killer. So Silence of the Lambs and Seven and Saw, they all owe this movie a debt of gratitude. Um, and, uh, and the child murderer kills these children, except what the movie is actually about, because the only, uh, well, I don't want to spoil the movie, but um, what the movie is actually about is the way that the society tears itself apart trying to catch the serial killer. So the villains of the film uh, obviously, there's the serial killer as a villain, but the police are also a villain in the film, and the gangsters are also a villain in the film. Um, and there's this really scary scene where the police just go into a bar and demand papers, please, to all of the people in the bar. And the, the people in the bar said, what are you talking about? I don't carry my birth certificate with me everywhere I go. And they say, look, if you don't have your papers, you're going to jail. And they do. They just arrest everybody that doesn't have proper paperwork. And that's a harbinger of things to come. And so the film is really on the nose about like, if you're going to have a society, no matter what threat you're dealing with, no matter how serious it is, you cannot destroy the civil liberties of people in your society to bring down this threat. You do more harm than good by, by going after these people. Um, and it ends on a huge question mark. In a weird way, I can't spoil this film because it kind of ends in the middle of a thought. It's a really interesting uh, film. Um, but Here's the thing, and this is where I got to kind of go back and give Nosferatu a little bit more credit than I was giving it earlier about the sign of the times. This film is so explicitly anti-fascist that Fritz Long had to leave 
um, you know, UFLA just to make it. Well, years later, um, when the Nazis are in power, they actually use the scene from this film where the serial killer, played here by Peter Lorre, uh, talks about why he commits these crimes, explains like what drives him to kill these children. And because Peter Lorre, the actor, was Jewish, um, the, uh, the Nazis use the scene from this film and say, this is what the Jews are like. So they totally take it out of context as if Peter Lorre is not an actor and just this is the man, a Jewish man, talking about how he loves killing children. Um, and so no matter how anti-fascist your movie was, no matter how hard you were trying to make an anti-Nazi film about you know, the wrongs of authoritarianism and, and overreach and, and state control, you actually couldn't make it good enough to ever get away uh, from what they were trying to do. Um, and, and even this movie could be turned into Nazi propaganda. So this movie comes out in 1931. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's the only sound movie that I've talked about. It's really, really good. Um, 1933, Hitler rises to power. He's elected. Even though he didn't win the popular vote, he's elected. Um, and, uh, and right next to him in his first cabinet, Minister of Agriculture, um, there he is, Hugenberg. Um, and so uh, they're working together at this point, and they go on a, a, a crusade to try to just um, censor anything and everything they can get their hands on. Uh, and uh, in, in, a, in a sad twist, one of the first groups of people they actually go after, especially in the context of talking about Murnau and some of these other people, are, are the gay community. Um, and so these book burnings, you often seen huge uh, pictures of book burnings and they're burning all kinds of books. They were burning the books of Al, uh, Albert Einstein because he was Jewish, you know, it didn't matter that it was about physics, they're burning those. But one of the first things they go after, go after is the Berlin Institute of Sexual uh, Research, which was actually a safe haven for LGBTQ people uh, at the time. So in May, 1933, only two months, uh, three months after Hitler is elected, um, uh, the Berlin Institute for Sexual Research is attacked for being un-German. The mob pulls out its entire library and burns the books, and its acting head is arrested. Um, and that's this. That's what you're looking at, you know, them burning the books from uh, the Berlin Institute for Sexual Research. And to think, in 1929, they came this close to actually legalizing homosexuality in Germany. Like, it was recommended by a committee in uh, Germany that homosexuality should be legalized. At that time, it was illegal to be gay. Um, about 6% of the population of uh, Berlin was openly gay. Um, so, I mean, this is a really interesting time in German history, and it all just gets destroyed by the Nazi rise to power um, in a very sad turn. Um, and in fact, um, even some of the Nazis were gay. Ernst Röhm, who was the head of the Brown Church, is actually a gay man. And in 1934, on November 8th and 9th, uh, they have the Night of the Long Knives, where the Nazis go in and take all of their own people that aren't ideologically pure and kill them. Uh, and Ernst Röhm, the head of the Brown Shirts, uh, was a gay man, and they actually executed him, uh, uh, allegedly for being gay, although possibly because he also rivaled Hitler uh, for power. And the average German just viewed this as anti-corruption measures rather than an assault on civil liberties. And so, uh, once you get into 1934, I mean, it's all over. They ban all, just about all the movies I was talking about. Um, I might add 1943, they released uh, a pamphlet uh, called um, The uh, Jewish Vampire Brings Chaos to the World. Uh, so Stryker never let go of the vampire metaphor. He kept on using it all the way through the war. Um, but uh, the actual movie Nosferatu couldn't be shown because it was uh, viewed as a cultist propaganda. Um, but Murnau didn't live to see any of this. He died in a car accident in California, driving, uh, veering off the highway on Route 1, or Highway 1 in California, which if you've ever been on it, it's along the seacoast. And he veered off the road and died. He was buried in Germany, though. Um, some of his other associates weren't as a fortunate, uh, or I say fortunate, obviously, uh, he died. But, you know, uh, Max Schreck also died before the war. But uh, Alvin Grau had to flee. Um, uh, Germany for being Jewish, he was able to make it out. Siegfried Krakauer obviously fleed. Um, uh, Alban Grau uh, made it to Switzerland in 1936 when occultism was banned. He was still part of the Fraternitas uh, Saturni and the Fraternitas Saturni was banned. 
and they, he had to flee to Switzerland. He eventually moved back to Germany. A lot of other people didn't. He moved back at the end of the war. Um, Conrad Veidt had to flee. If some of these actors look familiar, Conrad Veidt and Peter Lorre both had to flee. They both wound up being in the movie Casablanca, which I think is fascinating, uh, and any number of other people. Uh, Fritz Long had to flee. Uh, in fact, Goebbels approached him and asked him to uh, direct a film for the Nazis. And he said, well, you know, my, my uh, grandparents are Jewish, right? And he said, no, I didn't know that. And so that day, he went home and got all this stuff together. And a couple months later, he stole his wife's jewelry and fled across the border to France uh, with the money he got from his wife's jewelry because he, he was worried emptying his bank account um, wouldn't, uh, uh, would cause suspicion that he was obviously intending to flee. Um, and so Fritz Long makes it out. Uh, don't feel too bad for Theo von Harbo. She becomes a committed Nazi and makes Nazi propaganda films uh, throughout the, the rest of the war period. Um, Paul Zig, uh, who designed the sets for Der Golem, is accused of cultural Bolshevism. Uh, and it also has to, to run for his life. He eventually dies of an embolism uh, while on the run from the Nazis in Turkey. Um, it's also really sad to me that uh, in modern times, the word cultural Marxism has made a comeback when that's literally something the Nazis accused and imprisoned people for in the 1930s and 40s. Um, so, you know, what's sadly what's old is new. Um, uh, and, and all of this other people wind up having to flee. So the Nazis not only destroyed, you know, millions of people's lives, they also essentially destroyed the, the German film industry. All these people just ran for their lives once the Nazis came to power. Um, interestingly, as I said, Murnau is, is buried in Germany. Uh, in 2015, um, his bones were stolen. And when they went down to the crypt to try to see uh, evidence, they found wax arranged in a certain geometrical pattern. And so it's believed that somebody had done an occultist ritual and then stolen the bones of F.W. Murnau. And I don't think they have ever found the bones. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a, an interesting end for Murnau concerning his, his obvious association with horror. Although I should note, Murnau was not an occultist. Uh, all of his friends were, but he wasn't. Uh, so that's also doubly sad in that regard. Uh, I think I'll end this presentation uh, uh, actually with this poem that was written by um, Han, Hans Ehrenbaum uh, de Gale, who of course, as I mentioned, was Murnau's gay lover. And he sent this to him while World War I was going on. Um, and it says, dig your grave deeper, soldier. Perhaps one day peace will be born to the sound of bells from one tower to another and everything will shine again. Um, neither of them lived to see the Nazis, but uh, it is nonetheless a beautiful sentiment for the people that did survive uh, this period. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, one day the sound of bells uh, from one tower to another will be born in peace and everything will shine again. Uh, these are my uh, works cited. So since it's being recorded, if you want to take a screenshot of this when you watch the recording, you can see all of the different uh, sources I used, uh, especially on Nosferatu. And then this is just my final tribute to my old teacher, Professor Jennifer Taylor, uh, who uh, I took this class with for films in Weimar, Germany, way back in 2008. Uh, great teacher, great class. Uh, this is us reuniting in 2019 uh, when I went back to William and Mary to visit her. And then on the right, that's me in Berlin in 2007 on my study abroad trip to Germany, uh, where I had a great time and I got to walk some of these streets myself. Uh, so that's it. End of my presentation. <laughs>